Now, we've got one more topic to go over, and this is a method of um, putting together everything that we've covered in these last 50, 51 classes. And this is based loosely off of the step-by-step -step class. So at ashovedicastrology.com, under the MP3 audio classes, um, there's a 16, I think it's a 16-hour step-by-step class. It's all video. So um, we go through charts, we explore students' questions, and um, we have it broken down in a very precise manner. So for example, what's one of the ways that we begin looking at a chart. Well, number one, we always start with the Ascendant. We figure out what is the Ascendant, what is the energy and the quality of the Ascendant. That forms our foundational baseline. Next, we want to look at any planets impacting the Ascendant, or the Ascendant Lord, or the placement of the Ascendant. Okay? Meaning that we need to figure out what does it mean if Saturn is in the first house, or if Saturn rules the seventh and the eighth, and it's in the first. That has a meaning. In many books, and also in the step-by-step -step course, there's a list of ruler of the seventh and the first, ruler of the eighth and the first, and what those possible meanings are. So we start taking notes, writing that down. We also want to consider simultaneously, where does the first lord go? The first lord goes in the twelfth house. This will make a person uh, possibly sh more shy make them more internalized, not necessarily as active in the world. Uh, if the First Lord goes into the Tenth, more involved in career. First Lord goes into the Fifth, more involved in games and speculative investment. Uh, First Lord in the Second, more involved in financial responsibility. So we see, we have all these things that we have to understand. What do the houses mean? What does it mean having the First Lord in that particular house? And you can come up with this on your own, go back to the previous talks where we discuss the houses, figure out what one house means, and think about what would it mean if those two houses came together. Considering, just stepping a bit ahead here, if the third lord is in the eighth house, where th third lord deals with siblings, um, how we develop our courage, and those people that challenge us, our competition to a degree, sixth house does that as well. If we have that in the eighth, which is a house that deals with um, a crisis, drama, um, other people's money, a rejuvenation, all these different things, then what we're going to see is we're going to have this combination of uh, maybe the siblings causing some sort of crisis, that is if it's in bad dignity, or maybe the siblings contribute um, to our longevity in some fashion or form. Again, eighth house issues here. So we have to know how the planets as rulers come together. Now, so, step number one, what is the Ascendant? That shows who is this person, how are they going to project themselves to the world. Step number two, where does the Ascendant Lord go? Does the Ascendant Lord go into an angle or a trine? Does it go into a Dustana house? If so, what could that mean? That's going to give you an indication of what are they going to get, what is this person going to get involved with uh, more often in their life. Wherever the Ascendant Lord goes, that shows where is the body, the person's body, going to spend most of their time. You want to consider planets in the first house, because those will color how a person acts in the world. And as I've always said um, repeatedly, if we have a well-supported first house, but difficulties within the chart, then that person has better capacity to work with those difficulties and can still be successful. If we have a great chart, but we have um, the First Lord and difficult avashtas or difficult placements, they're going to have a much harder time uh, making good of that chart. So we need to weigh all of these factors, and we need to consider dignity. The dignity will indicate if the area is going to be um, supported. So First Lord in the Twelfth, and good dignity will give good results in regards to 12th house matters. Bad dignity, bad results in 12th house matters. What are some 12th house matters? 12th house matters can be contemplation, meditation, expenses. So good dignity first house lord in the 12th.
can show a person who manages their expenses well or spends on good things. It can show a person skilled in meditation or spending time in hospitals or ashrams in a positive manner. If we have the 12th floor in bad dignity, maybe they have many expenses that are not good. Maybe they spend time in places away from the world, such as hospitals, prisons, detention centers, warehouses, however you want to think about it, if you consider that to be negative, then the negative aspect comes out. So, Ascendant. Where does the Ascendant Lord go? Who is impacting the Ascendant? That's to get the, the, foundation, the foundational basis of the chart. Next thing you want to gauge is the, um, the angles and the trines. Start with the angles. Houses 1, 4, 7, and 10. If there's a predominance of benefic, helpful planets in angles, can generally indicate the person will have an easier life, more grace within their life. If there's a preponderance of malefic planets in angles, the person works harder. They have a harder life. Um, or they're more used to dealing with stress. So consider the nature of the planets and in the angles, that's going to show you how is the life going to um, express in general. And of course, the dignity plays a role. Benefics and good dignity, more grace, more ease, things happen naturally. Um, benefics and bad dignity, the person expects things to happen easier than they do. And so they don't really make anything of themselves too much because they're just waiting for the next good thing to come along. They don't have any force of their own. Malefics and bad dignity, well, that's just a hard life. That's where things go wrong and um, a lot of frustrations, again, depending on the planets. Malefics and bad dig excuse me, malefics and good dignity, a hard worker, someone who can access and tap into the power of those malefic planets. So we need to understand these things. We can look to the trines, houses five and nine. Good planets, or the ruler of the fifth house and good dignity, this is a person that can make good progress in this life. They can even deal with negativity better. They can grow from negativity better. Again, um, supportive planets in the fifth, um, good dignified planets in the fifth, and good avashtas. Also in the ninth, that shows care coming towards them. So good dignified planets in the ninth, that trine, can show that this person gets taken care of to a degree, or they have grace coming to them, depending on the nature of those planets, and the house lords that those planets um, indicate, where the whatever houses are, whatever house lords are in the ninth, will show where some of this help can come from. And this is just the beginning. So once we get this, now we start going through the chart, looking at the second house in the same fashion. What's impacting the second house? Is that helping or hurting? Where is the second lord? What can that tell us about how the person meets their responsibilities? What can that tell us about the person's wealth? Is it good or is it bad? Good dignity, bad dignity. Good of Ashtas, bad of Ashtas. Again, these are all things that we've covered previously. And the Vashta is not so much because they're quite detailed, but they are covered in the Lajitati of Ashtas class. And you do that for every single... Um, house. And that can take a long time. When I've sat down and completely gone through a person's chart, looking at each house, it takes me upwards of 12 to 14 hours just for that, because you look at the house, you look at the planets in the house, you look at where the house lord goes. So the planets in the house will show you what is actively impacting that house, either supporting or detracting, again, based on the dignity. You see where does the house lord go? to show what exactly is um, what exactly is that house lord getting involved with. So second house, uh, finances and resources. If it goes into the ninth, maybe the person makes their uh, money through education. If it goes to um, the eighth, maybe they make their money through crisis oriented things or eighth house oriented things, longevity, health related things. And you do this for every single house. Now, to add to that, you have to look at the Vargas. You have to look at the Vargas. If you don't, you're going to miss a lot. Um, and this was just indicated by a chart that I was looking at with a, a client who is also a student, and it's always fun to talk to clients who are students, especially when they're on the ball, because they start bringing up things that maybe you don't see, and you bring up things that they don't see, and you get uh, great synergy going. And I, always, I often thought it would be great if a number of astrologers could get together and say, have four astrologers working on a chart, 
um, because then you know we could cover so much more ground and we'd see things uh, we'd see things from different perspectives. So anyway, off topic, but that would be a fascinating thing. And if you do that with your friends, do that with friends. You'll have a lot of, a lot of fun with it. But anyway, for the first house, you look at the Trimsumptia, the D30, for health of the body, for um, the fate of one's path. For the second house, you also look at the Hora. See what see where the overlap is. If the same indications are in the Hora that are in the birth chart, uh, the second house in the birth chart, that's a stronger confluence. For the third house, look at the Drekana. Uh, for the fourth house, look at the Chattertumsha. Fifth house, um, oftentimes you want to look at the Suptumsha. For the sixth house, again, you go back to the Trimsumsha, the D30, because that um, deals with health. For the seventh house, you want to look at, once more, the uh, Suptamsha. Well, for the ninth house, you want to look at the uh, Navamsha. Tenth house, you want to look at the D10, the Dasamsha. And so you can see there's a particular Varga for every house, and you want to assess the house in the birth chart, but then you also want to go to the Varga itself and see where you can get confluence, where you can get similar meanings. Where you get similar meanings, you're going to be more accurate, more spot on with your predictions. Where you see difference, well, that doesn't mean you're going to be incorrect. And this is the most important aspect of uh, astrology. It means that the person doesn't have uh, the same karma as going in the same directions. Remember, we've always said that you have to be in the right place, at the right time, with the right people, doing the right thing to get results. Well, if a person's hora says that wealth is going to indicate this, but the person's second house says wealth is going to indicate this, and they're they're uh, different. Well, then you have to somehow figure out where where is the middle ground in there. If the hora says the same thing, then that's a pretty consistent result that you can be very sure of um, coming to fruition. And this is a very simple process of assessing a chart. When we did the step by step class, you know, we looked at just for example. Um, the, the sixth house. We look at the sixth house, the sixth lord, impact on the sixth lord, whether it's good or bad avashtas. Then we'd go to the Trimsumsha. We'd do the same thing. We'd go back to the sixth house and we'd consider the Baladi avashtas, the Lajatadi avashtas. We'd consider um, the Jagradadi avashtas because all these are going to give us more coloration in regards to what the person's going to get, how much are they going to get of what. Because the sixth lord might be in terrible shape. But if the Sixth Lord gains help from friends, then whatever those friends represent will show how that area of life gets supported. And that's reflected in you know, situations where things go wrong, but then help comes in and lifts you up. Also, if we have um, a particular House Lord in a bad situation, or excuse me, a particular House Lord in a good situation, then that shows good promise, but if it's getting hurt by enemies, then it shows something coming into fruition, so success, but then getting hurt by the planets that are hurting it in regards to what they indicate. Okay, um, so for example, someone can have their um, a very a good seventh lord, which would give good relationship, good spouse. But let's say that seventh lord is under the influence of a malefic third house lord, or sixth house lord, or eighth house lord. So you get the spouse. But then when the dasha comes around for that negative third uh, enemy to hit, well then you get, you've gotten the spouse, but then the spouse is taken out by an accident or um, injury or something of that nature or experiences that. So we always have to remember there's no, usually no black and white. There's do you get it? And then there's what happens after you get it. Do you get it is, is dependent on the natural state of the house involved in the house lord. If all those are strong, good house, good house lord, then you get it. You know, assuming that the uh, Jagradadi and Baladi of Ashtas support it. But now you want to figure out well, what happens after you get it. If there are positive uh, Lajatadi of Ashtas on it, well then you get it and it gets better. If there are negative Lajatadi of Ashtas against it, then you get it, but it gets hurt. So these are the ways that we start to assess and analyze the chart. And these are dependent on Dasha. And this is one of the things that we're going to be going over in the Dasha course coming up in June um, of this year, the, um, the webinar, is that we're going to take all of this information and we're going to start to look at, well, once you know these basics, 
then you can start to see them through the dashes, which is why reading the birth chart first is the key to understanding dashes. And going along with that, what we always have to remember, and this is where a lot of people get frustrated, is that some charts don't, they're not obvious. What I mean by that is, there's so many contradictions in it. One part of the chart says you're going to be successful. The other part of the chart says you're going to fail. One part of the chart says you're going to be healthy. The other part of the chart says, you know, you're going to experience um, illness. And that's life. Because people are so contradictory in their thoughts, in their directions, that they'll go one way, but then they'll go another way. So, you know, they might be successful for a little while while that dosh is running, in, indicated by the planet that says success, but then they'll hit the planet that indicates um, difficulty, and then they hit difficulty. So if, if you see all these um, confounding or contradictory influences, it's only because that's how people are, and you know, the, the charts reflect it. Every now and then, you find a chart where everything lines up, and those are, those are the most enjoyable charts to do because it's very easy to make predictions for that person. Because no matter what dasha they go through, there's some sort of indication of success there. Or it can go the opposite direction, meaning that it can be so bad that it's easy to make a prediction because there are so many um, consistent indications for failure that it's just it's easy to see. Meaning you go through a dasha, and in this particular dasha, um, it's, say, Jupiter-Mars. And Jupiter and Mars are in trines from each other, and it deals with wealth. Well, they're in trines from each other in the Hora and the Chattatamsha and the birth chart. It all lines up. Easy to say during that dasha that there are going to be continued wealth and growth of wealth and success there. And then the next dasha, it's, um, I don't know, Jupiter and the Sun. And Jupiter and the Sun are in trines from each other or angles from each other. Again, easy to predict that this is going to be a helpful time period for them. So we need to, we need to see this kind of confluence to give specific results. So sometimes it's not you. Sometimes it's just that the chart is full of contradictions because people's lives are full of contradictions. And that's what makes uh, astrology a difficult subject to study because we're always looking for black and white. And we have to learn to expand our minds beyond that to see the nuance and the color of it. So anyway, this is a, a basic approach that you can use to um, start using what we've already gone through in these past uh, 51 or 52 talks, however many we've done so far, and put it into play. And take some time with it. This is not going to happen in six months unless you're um, a savant. Uh, this is going to take you a couple years, and you need to look at multiple charts, and you need to be very honest about those charts, and if you don't see something, don't make it up, just say, I don't see that there. Um, and then, as you get more confident, if you want to explore more aspects, um, then start studying the Lajitadya Vashtas, then get more detailed into the Vargas, then get more into the nakshatras. Until you get these basics, these other things are just going to be more confusion for you. You're going to think, oh, well, this means that, and this means that, and so this, I should go this way, and I should think like this. And then you'll say, but it doesn't make any sense. And then you'll throw up your hands and say, astrology doesn't work. So you got to start with these basics. Take it a step at a time. Make sure that you are interested in learning these things because you have a sheer joy, not because you're afraid of your chart or because you're afraid of karma. If you're trying to learn this based on fear of what's going to happen to you or what's going to happen to others, you're not going to learn it very well. It has to be something that's of interest to you naturally, of something that you just really enjoy investigating, something that you enjoy the, the discovery, you enjoy the frustration, you enjoy all aspects of it. It's, it's an exploration for you. If you have that kind of curiosity about it, you'll do very good with astrology. And if you don't do very good with astrology, at least you'll learn a lot about how the universe works, which is very helpful. Um, it's a very excellent spiritual practice in and of itself. But using it as spiritual practice, you do need to have regular meditation practice. Um, I recommend at least once a day, working up to an hour a day, whether you're just doing a mantra or breath awareness or even contemplating uh, astrological indications. You need to have some sort of practice um, because this is, in my mind, meant to be a yogic science. And the more time you devote to contemplation, the more understanding you have. Whether you can make predictions or not, the more understanding you have, which is the key. And you can probably make good predictions if you have an excellent Venus. Uh, and you can probably be a good counselor if you have an excellent Jupiter. If you don't have either one of those, uh, you might want to just treat astrology as uh, an interesting hobby for you. 
again, you don't want to make a hard and fast rule there because you know there are other modifying factors. Jupiter can be helped by its enemies, uh, not by its enemies. Jupiter can be helped by its uh, friends. Venus can be helped by its friends, and there are certain Varga charts where Jupiter needs to be stronger for this. So we don't want to make hard and fast rules here, but in general, you know, if you're curious about astrology, do a, a thorough assessment of your Jupiter and your Venus. If Jupiter and Venus are good, you'll be a good predictive astrologer, and you'll be a good um, counseling astrologer. If only Venus is good throughout the charts, you'll be better at prediction, not necessarily counseling. And if Jupiter is good, you'll be a better counseling astrologer. So, either way, keep all this in mind, and uh, I appreciate your uh, hanging in there with these videos and these talks. Hopefully you've learned a lot. Go back and review, and we'll be in touch soon.